I call this house the order. The motion for the grand final is this house believes that, oh sorry, <laughs> this, this, house, this house believes that the EU should ban ultra national, nationalist or far right political parties. We had um, SOKA on opening, uh, opening government, KDSA on opening opposition, Love Sexy Canadians on closing government, Safia A on closing opposition. I call upon the Prime Minister to open grand final. You're here. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, so favoritism, an exclusive idea in terms of political ideology, Mr. Speaker, doesn't make society better, doesn't make the society move forward as a community, Mr. Speaker. We need more inclusive flavor as a political structure that welcomes the everything, uh, every kind of ideology, uh, that welcomes the various type of people and welcome and um, respect the fundamental rights of those individuals. So we see in the particular context of EU the welcoming a lot of migrant economic migrants or other refugees as a foreigners. So we see the rise of nationalism, Mr. Speaker. But we think this idea is making the society much much worse off. Therefore, we are proud to propose this motion. So on the definition, we are talking about the, con uh, the EU country and the, uh, the uh, far right uh, far right political party means that the party that uphold the xenophobia ideology or that party that try to exclude the migrants coming from the foreign country um, and they try to um, uh, they try to maximize the benefit of only domestic citizens and they exclusively uh, reject the existence of other uh, country people from other country no so the we conduct the election and uh, having the third party organization institution that operate a, a national election to check the ideology of each political party and if we find the far right idea which is extremely nationalistic idea that we exclude those parties so having uh, have, okay the, uh, yeah okay Simply put, isn't the reason why you are saying they're bad is because we had a discourse about it and yeah, yeah. came to the conclusion that it is actually bad. I'm happy to talk about the impossibility of discourse because very, very exclusive idea which never allows you to concede your extremely nationalistic ideology. But moving on to the uh, argument. I have three arguments to talk about. Firstly, I'd like to talk about the context of this debate. Secondly, I'd like to talk about why this far-right idea shouldn't be formed as a political party that might have the political enforcement to, uh, to impose their own ideology to other citizens. Second, uh, thirdly, I'd like to talk about why we can uh, we see in the, car in the current situation we see the hatred and the friction between the citizens. Why, after taking this proposal, we can ease and create more inclusive state that having more healthy discussion. Sir. No, maybe not to the first level about the context of the debate. This debate. So we are looking at the EU country such as France or Sweden. We have a lot of economic migrants coming to this country, Mr. Speaker. So we say there's some uh, there's sometimes have a problem between the uh, national and the domestic citizens and foreign citizens, Mr. Speaker. And we see a rise of nationalism. They try to capitalize on the situation, the difference between the national uh, domestic citizen and foreign citizen. And actually, in France and Sweden, this kind of nationalistic political party actually gaining the seat. With Within the, uh, within the national parliament, Mr. Speaker, we say it is extremely, uh, extremely harmful, and uh, this, they, this just creates the antipathy that create the uh, create the decision and try to re reject the foreigners, such as Roma people in the France are likely to be rejected by this country. That the international society claims that this is the absolute, um, absolute injustice that. Uh, that infringes the fundamental human rights of those people. So having clarified this context, maybe now to the second level, why we shouldn't allow this right, uh, the far right idea. So we have two reasons. 
Why? First of all, it's about exclusivity, as I told you in, the, uh, in my first uh, in my introduction. So this kind of exclusive nationalistic idea that try to only benefit only the domestic citizens, Mr. Speaker, it never be, uh, never provide the benefit to the foreign uh, foreign citizens that may have the different background, Mr. Speaker. We can't allow this uh, this kind of ideology into the national parliament, Mr. Speaker, because the national parliament is the parliament that reflects the diverse interests of every single people existing in the country, Mr. Speaker. We say, uh, and moreover, in terms of discussion or in terms of political uh, negotiation, these people are far less likely to conceive their own idea. Why is that, Mr. Speaker? Because their fundamental, uh, fundamental idea is their flagship, Mr. Speaker. The fundamental uh, nationalistic idea is only be achieved, can be only be achieved by having the maximum amount of benefit that, that they can bring, Mr. Speaker. If they fail to provide the 100, uh, maximum amount of benefit to their own domestic citizen, Mr. Speaker, that if they have the room to concede, and if they have the room to benefit the foreigners, it will be mutually exclusive between the, their idea and outcome of their action, Mr. Speaker. That's why in the first place, these people are highly likely to have to concede their own idea, the strongly uh, cap capitalizing off their own uh, ideology, maybe not the second level. So practicing this idea ultimately harms the particular group, Mr. Speaker. As I told you before, in France, in the Roma people are expelled from the country, deprived their household, deprived their where, uh, deprived the place to live, and sustain their own life, Mr. Speaker. We say it's extremely harmful infringement of fundamental human rights on those people. Moreover, in country like Sweden, if those people if the Nationalist Party try to claim the job for domestic citizens, Mr. Speaker, it means automatically deprivation of those economic migrants coming from the foreign country. Those people are likely to be shut down, or, or those people are likely to be restricted to coming from uh, coming from another country, or sometimes they are expelled, Mr. Speaker. This is the fundamental infringement of the basic human rights of those people that we shouldn't tolerate, because the government is the only body that, um, that can protect those people. Uh, and as a fundamental human right. Therefore, we ban the religious party in the same reason, having the exclusivity and dogmatic idea that only uh, that perpetuate the situation of the uh, of the minority. Maybe not the last practical point. Why does hatred and friction is created in the status quo, Mr. Speaker? It's very clear. Because of the existence of political party, try to advocate your own idea, ascribing the all harms or all problems in the society on the shoulder of economic migrants or other foreign people, Mr. Speaker, by saying because of the existence of those people, social order is corrupting. That even though there there's some uh, there's there's some the failure or there's some other data, but that there's people have certain uh, certain uh, influence or certain uh, image that the created by the politician that that try to distort the existence of migrant economic migrants in the first place, Mr. Speaker. We say it is extremely harmful. And but after taking this proposal, we can realize healthy discussion. We can remove these this kind of patriotic issue from the national election, we can have the more constructive, a uh, constructive discussion that can benefit the all people within the society. The for sake of true democracy, for sake of more inclusive society, we are very proud to propose. Number one, the fact is, even if they are getting some seats, they're not a majority, so it's not some 
not, not something you should be worrying about. But more importantly, even if they are guessing seats, and even if, if, even if they are a majority, it actually means that the people inside that nation have arrived at that social value, at that social consensus, after a discussion, after a discourse. So we're more than happy to accept that country's um, social will. Moreover, we don't think that such socially exclusive ideas won't be in power, because on side of the decision, we trust the, the people, the citizens, and we trust the citizens to see through the bullshit ideas that actually may come out. We're happy to trust the citizens, it's a shame if those people don't want to trust them. And then the fact about the Roman people getting kicked out, we think it's the role of the other political parties, the far left parties or those in the moderate areas, to fight back against the far right and create a discourse and convince the people to actually say it's that these people should also be included. We think that's the role of the other political parties and we don't, and we don't think that we should be intervening into politics to just, you know, to, to get a, an ideal world, whatever that means. So number one, you are. No. Our stance is that simply we're going to allow all sorts of parties to exist. We're happy to have discourse about every single sort of parties, and we think it should be the citizens that decide. Okay. Firstly, it's important to have them in the public sphere because you get discourse about them. By being able to recognize they exist, and by being able to recognize what they stand for and what their policies are, it gives you the right and the power to be able to denounce those policies and say that policy is wrong for this and this reason. The only way you can fight on political ground is if you have them actually on the political sphere with where there are rules existing. It's important also to recognize the fact that politics is not black and white. Therefore, you cannot just simply say this party is bad because it is a far-right party. It's important to look at each and every type of far-right parties or any party that exists and have a discussion on each and every one. The problem with that side of the house is that they say far-right parties and they have, you know, put all bunch of them all together and said that the same. But we think there are still a spectrum existing even inside the far-right parties to what degree they are really a rightist. And we think in that context, it's important to have a, you know, a discussion about each and every one and recognize and create a social value to what extent we're going to accept them as not for each and every nation. We need to recognize that we're talking about a context of a country that has democracy as its type of government and that values discourse. We think discourse is something that is necessary to really create a social value and we think that creation of the value is the number one, is the number one thing that inside the democracy um, people should value and the, the state of democracy people value. We think in the EU state there is a trend of becoming secular, we agree, but we think that that trend can only be questioned and that trend can only be talked about and discussed about if we actually have these parties on the political sphere and we think it's important to question that trend and the only way we can do that is by having them in the political sphere. We think it's also important to recognise that if they are in the political sphere, we're going to be able to have dialogue with these people. We're, by having dial dialogues with these people, we also need to recognise that by having far-right parties, they are obviously going to have, to some extent, supporters in that nation. There are going to be people supporting them, and those people supporting these far-right parties are also citizens who have, their, who have the right to have their views in, put inside right. politics. Sir. The fact is, after the plan, that side of the house is simply going to kick everyone out and disregard even those citizens who have that sort of political will just because they simply think it's bad. They think that's wrong. Sir. They, they, these people who do support these kind of um, Far-right parties also have a right to have their views out in the political sphere in order to be discussed. And at the end of the day, if they get rejected, then that's the consensus of that country. So, the problem with that case is that after the plan, these parties do not disappear. These parties do not just simply disband and you know change some change their ideas. They still exist in society. These people still, still exist with the same old principles and the yeah, same yeah. values, wanting to kick the Pakistanis out the, or wanting to kick the Muslims out of that country. The fact is, after the plan, we can't check them. After the plan, we can't observe them. After the plan, there is no way to fully act against them using the law or using a clear rule which these people, which these um, far right people also agreed to. That's the. Um, that's the brilliance of the status quo, in that we can fight them on an equal playing field, whereas after the plan, we have no way to check them. We think it's going to become even worse, because they're going to become a private entity, a private group, and it kind of becomes like a religion of, of taking that plan. And you can't really denounce them, because they can simply say, that's what I believe in, and it's core to 
um, same ID, and therefore it's not going to have a discourse, or even if discourse happens, it's just going to be even more radicalized because there is no rule stopping them from becoming even more and more radical. We think that's even more harmful than the state's quo. Well, our members of far right parties become moderate when they have discussions. No, we don't think they will become moderate, but that's the yeah. thing. We want them to stay in order to have that discussion in the first place, and that discussion is what we're supporting on opening opposition. We don't like to just kick them out just because we simply think they're wrong. We want the citizens to come to that conclusion that they are wrong using that discussion, and that's what we value on our side of the house. Finally, talking about the EU. The EU is a... Uh, a a, what, 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 it's an institution that values cultural unification over everything else, even over economic growth. Firstly, when Ireland said no to the EU, we had a referendum yet again and because we valued that consensus. We test immigrants that come in, we have common courts in the EU. It just shows that EU is an institution that values the unification of all the societies and of all the values that exist. We think it's wrong to just arbitrarily say some random thing is bad. We, we think it's important to have an engagement. And we think to be in line with the core principles of the European Union to start with, we think it's important to have cultural unification and engagement. We think taking out these parties just because they simply think it's bad without even looking at what type of party they are is illegitimate when we consider that fact. So at the end of the day, we think at my second time of trying in the grand finals of the Rusa Cup, I think I'm going home with a trophy time. <laughs>
the quality of the uh, quality of right ridiculous the nationalism are uprising okay. in the status quo EU is now having like economic crisis in, in this society people have always dissatisfaction because of the low job list or because of, because uh, they can, are not satisfied with the state the situation in the society in the status quo most having the in the status quo, you have a huge nationalism in the society, even for the like, independence movement, like, like in the Catalonia or the Flemish Flemish region, we have the independence movement. Because for those people, they only care about their own community in a society like this. In the, for the German, those German people just care about the benefit, and they often are being their like cause of the like economic crisis to the minority group, and those like targeting the minority group is outlet for the people to release the stress. No sit down. Because those like ultra nationalist group gave like a very like extreme propaganda to the, those the existence of the minor group or like Romani people or the, like Algerian people in France deprive our job. Of course they they get, they get relief because we are not bad, but those like the minor people are outsiders uh, are the cancer in a society. Those feelings are often seen, especially in the case of the economic recession. We see this situation in the EU now. Therefore, those like people who are supporting the international group is not rational to uh, do not have the like rational thinking to care about like a benefit, you know, economical benefit or like a political uh, ideology. They do not have this. The politicians should not. The government should not respect such kinds of idea who just based on the ideology or the, just, just a notion that they just have to uh, prioritize our own benefit. Thirdly, not sit down. I'd like to enhance my partner's <coughs> argument. My, yes. Okay, so do you want to talk about ideology? The EU's entire stance about unity is also an ideology. Right? Why do you barely push out any ideology and not have any In the case of the unity, they will, they will never make the, like they will never make the, the, the target a certain kind of the group based on the based on the vast total, right? But like especially for the in the case of France, even though, like if you were the like, Algerian uh, immigrant, even though you were born uh, because you were born of the children of the immigrant Algerian immigrant, they will never have the citizenship in a society because German people want their own children to just have a citizenship and have jobs in a society, they would be dis discriminated in a society be be not based on those kind of like equality. But for the case of the unity cases, we have no victim in a society. Also, of course, the EU is a, a symbol of the inequality in a society. We just uh, it is okay for us to just prioritize the I ideology of the integrity in the EU European unions. Secondly, I'm going to mention about how in the status quo, uh, those uh, people like in the, uh, in the European Union are suffering right now and after the proposal, how this proposal uh, uh, resolves those kind of problems. Mr. Speaker, like as I tell you, as I told you before, those like people are driven by the like driver by the like hatefully, driven by the this sense of dissatisfaction towards the status quo. Therefore, in the, even though they say like in the financial Germany, they, t they often say like they want to, like they have to like exclude the immigrant from a society, even they would be uh, excluded, they do not engage in the job like often immigrants engage in, like a very low cheaper wages or very like simple labor, so they do not do this. The pause for the case of just the outlet for the stress, they are now victimized. But after this proposal, what will happen is that even for those like even though they are born in the like minor ethnic group, but they are living in the uh, other regions, they just have to get the support from the government based on based on the economic situation or based on the political situation. Because though even though like there is a a politi uh, right group polit politicians who have the discriminatory idea towards a certain like ethnic group or minority, they cannot raise their voice in the parliament so that they should eliminate those kind of people. They will have to endure that they also have to uh, prioritize the benefit on, also for the minor people. For all those reasons, I make the propose. <laughs> Prime Minister, I call up the second speaker from the Office of the Constitution to deliver your speech for the 
premise of government is that this, the government of the nation state should always treat domestic nationals and foreigners in exactly the same level, in exactly the same quality. We don't think there's any moral obligation for the liberal democracy to, to treat those people in exactly the same level. As long as the fundamental minimum level of human rights are guaranteed, ladies and gentlemen, that's what people inside the nation state should decide throughout the discourse, throughout the democratic procedure, in order for proper democracy, democracy to function, we need public discourse to begin with. This is exactly why we are happy to have any political party based on any ideology. I'm going to talk about several issues from this side of the house. Firstly, what's the criterion to ban parties? Second of all, I'm going to further analyze the principle of EU. Thirdly, I'm going to talk about how to deal with the super crazy radical policy that they are talking about, they are warned about in this debate. Thirdly, oh, sorry, finally, I'm going to talk about uh, how you know, those radical uh, and the cultural uh, discourse will go underground, which is rather di uh, dangerous for society. So, a uh, reputation will be all, all included. First of all, what's the criterion to ban parties? Ladies and gentlemen, fundamentally, every ideology is to some extent exclusive or focusing on superiority, superiority such as religion or ethnicity or gender, even political ideology too, ladies and gentlemen, all ideology or any ideology is to some extent exclusive and focusing on superiority. But that's not the reason for, uh, for the state or any actor to ban the parties to begin with. No, thank you. That criterion is arbitrary just because national, nationalism seems for them very radical very like, extreme, we should ban them. That's what people should decide, not the government side, ladies and gentlemen. When the sum value is ambiguous, people should decide throughout the public discourse. As people have a sovereignty within the nation state, this is exactly how democracy functions in the first place. This is exactly why the British national uh, BNP in UK is like, uh, perceived as, uh, 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 as exclusive like a uh, radically exclusive party by even British people too, ladies and gentlemen. People have the capability to uh, participate in the discourse and make a rational judgment. Government assumes that people have the capability to understand that stupid things are stupid. That's why state gives suffrage or right to vote to the people to begin with after reaching the age of consent. Therefore, when the sum value is ambiguous, that's what people should decide, not the government or any actor, to arbitrarily decide. Uh, we can't make an objective value judgment that is Universally or objectively wrong. That's totally uh, ridiculous. Second of all, that is a principle of EU or integration of those things. First of all, as I said before, there's no moral obligation in a liberal democracy that says the favoritism toward national people is always wrong. That's what people should decide throughout the discourse. Moreover, the counter analysis from this side of the house is a nation is composed by the system of cooperation, which means that those within the framework have a right to decide who. who uh, who uh, should be like, eligible to enter the countries. This is exactly why the, the national state always have the immigration test when they accept the immigrants from other countries. Because, because, you know, the nation is based on the constitution, working towards a certain goal. This is how the, you know, a country is, uh, is working, not just the geographical territory, but the political boundary as a whole is working, ladies and gentlemen. Therefore, because the nation is a system of cooperation, those within the framework should have the, should have the sovereignty, should have a right to, who, to, to whom that they extend their cooperation to. In exactly, in, in particularly or uniquely, EU is a collective <coughs> reflection of member states, which means that those people within the EU have a sovereignty or a right to decide who to enter, who to enter the, their own framework, ladies and gentlemen. Therefore, if citizens within the framework think that it's not a right thing to like uh, give disproportionate amount of service or public service to the immigrant people or foreign workers, that's legitimate interest in the first place, ladies and gentlemen. The premise of that side of the house is you know, the national ultra-nationalism or exclusivity is always universally wrong interest. No, ladies and gentlemen, that's people should decide. Citizens should decide. If people think it is legitimate interest, the government have active duty or moral responsibility to reflect their opinion. That's how democracy is about, especially EU's paramount value. It's cultural unification. That's, my partner already talked about so many analogies and precepts. Because EU is yeah. specifically focusing on cultural unification, if those people within the framework think that, you know, a disproportionate amount of service towards the you know, immigrant worker is unethical yeah. to the principle of EU, then, then those political ways should be prioritized. That's how state work, you know, EU as an you know, international multinational framework works in the previous space. No, thank you. How we deal with the super stupid radical policy that they are talking about in this space? Several responses. First of all, if the domestic law is so stupid, like, just like it, let's impose this value on immigrants. But if the domestic laws are so stupid, the EU, Commons, uh, EU Supreme Court 
I can exercise judicial review to check whether the domestic law is unconstitutional or not in the first place. The EU uh, super, super, Supreme Court has the capability to intervene and protect the fundamental human rights, the basic minimum level of rights of minority people that they are talking about in this debate, ladies and gentlemen. In this, we agree to some extent, you know, ethnic minority and those people are suffering by the social persecution in the status quo. Uh, it's wrong because of the matter of black history, but if the minimum basic fundamental human rights are infringed by the domestic law, we believe the Supreme Court of EU has the capability to exercise a judicial review to check the constitutionality of those domestic law. Moreover, ladies and gentlemen, the second of all, we don't think the politicians like, have incentive to really, really antagonize people by this stupid policy. We don't think that's how the real society works. I'll take you now. So people are so exclusive and incapable to have constructive discussion. In this situation, how can you say that you can achieve the multicultural understanding because we see no concession? Okay. We don't think we want. We have to protect multicultural, uh, multicultural society in the first place. What we have to talk about in this debate is a cultural unification within the EU boundary, ladies and gentlemen. That's what people want. That's what you know. That's the paramount necessity and prerequisite of EU in the first place. Moreover, ladies and gentlemen, in order to engage the idea of national super stupid logical ideology, we need to have a discourse within um, a right range of of actors in the first place. That's why status quo is good, because you know the politi a political discourse is broadcasted throughout the TV or featured by newspaper. That's how people understand what is happening in the po political sphere. That is promoting and facilitating the political dialogue among the people. But after taking proposal, what will happen? The final issue. First of all, the, nat the ultra-national like, uh, ideology will be normalized in society as a culture, as a social norm, which is more dangerous, ladies and gentlemen. People do not think it is unnatural in the first place, it is, but it is normalized in society. That's the dangerous thing of their proposal, right? They want to push those ideological ideology to the underground, to behind the scenes, like a private entity, like for example, a corporation might refuse to hire those ethnic group, or social persecution by the, your neighborhood will be more exacerbated. Those the cultural culturalization or normalization will be much much harder to tackle or uh, fight against. That's why we oppose their proposal. Thank you. I thank this the leader of opposition. I call on the first speaker from closing government to deliver a speech with his cabinet. Respect to fundamental human rights is necessarily ultimately a very fragile concept. So when, when, when 
when, you, when, when they suffer from things such as economical depression, which is harming Europe in the right in, in, in the status quo, like the expression made by these radical party, parties, such as like the reason why Germany is, su is such an economical trouble is because we had to pay for the pension cost of Turkish immigrants, necessarily gains traction. We believe the consequence of that. People cannot make a rational distinction between that. But secondly, ultimately, we do not think that democratic principle is absolute. Majority do not have the right to infringe specific fundamental human rights of individual. And we say not feeling intimidated, not feeling scared of being like intimidated by this political party is necessarily a fundamental human rights of individual. No, thank you. We do not think that just because it was democratically consented, that people in Germany has the right to consent to allow Nazi in Germany. We say that that was abhorrent. I'm going to further explain this in my substantive. But finally, the, 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 the basic like argument was all, all about like we need to facilitate discourse and discussion. I hate this discourse argument and debate. <laughs> They did not really. They didn't, they didn't really explain what was the concrete result of having that particular discussion. What, what kind of policy is going to be implemented as a consequence of that discourse? They haven't made it uh, clear at all. But the one thing that the Weave opposition made it perfectly clear, clear is that as a consequence of discourse, we're not going to moderate these radical parties. That is something that they could they could be, like make sure in today's debate. So I have two points of extension. Firstly, why the European Union has a unique justification to impose specific political value upon its member state. Firstly, because member state of the European Union has consented to, to the value and the principle is the establishment of the European Union. They have, a, they have an obligation to o, o, uh, follow the value of the European Union. The very fact that these member states like, ha, have entered and keep continue to bec become the member of the EU state is necessarily a sign that these uh, member states have consented to the particular value. But secondly, we say that certain values are absolutely bad, absolutely abhorrent, and we should not allow them to, in, in, in our, in our like, di discourse. We're talking about value which uses fear, which uses hatred, which uses intimidation, Mr. Speaker, because these kind of things necessarily scares people away from having any meaningful, meaningful discourse. Like, how can a Turkish immigrant living in Germany have any meaningful discourse when, like, nationalist political party in Germany continues to intimidate these kind of people? We believe that since it undermines discourse, we should not allow this to happen. But thirdly, we say... Uh, the, the, the trending stance of the European Union is necessarily is to restrict, restrict individual rights in order to achieve a greater social good or to the protection of fundamental human rights. That's why many member states of the European Union do not allow Holocaust denial because even though like, like freedom of expression is necessarily nice, member, many member states recognize this, those kind of things. Uh, protection of fundamental human rights is necessarily important. But fourthly and finally, this is going to be like a very, very unique contribution coming from the closing, of, uh, closing government. We say that there's a historical obligation for U European Union to be extra sensitive and extra careful when, 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 we are, when we're talking about like extremist and radicalist value. In the, in the 1930s, Germany was suffering from economical depression. Adolf Hitler and Nazis propagated the idea that the reason why Germany is such an economical trouble is because of Jews, and they started genociding Jews. Well, we draw a parallel to that situation and today's situation. What these ultra-nationalist parties are doing in the status quo, uh, the kind of propagation, of, the idea that they are propagating is that they're saying the reason why Germany is in such economical trouble is because we have to pay for the pension costs of Turkish immigrants. The reason why there's so many crime happening in Italy is because we have so many African immig immigrants. Now, we're not going to like be in ignorant and say like, this is going to lead to like another Nazi, but the thing is, we believe that European Union has an historical obligation to be extra careful and sensitive when allowing these extremist political party because, I'll take you in a moment, European Union was based uh, on the memory and the, uh, the regret of the Holocaust and pledged uh, pledge that we would never allow those kind of atrocities to happen again. So why do we think that legitimizing these political party necessarily empowers radicalists? Close. So you're talking about where this will lead. If government benches analysis is right and these people are so hate-filled, if you take away their one avenue to express themselves, aren't they probably necessarily okay. going to turn violent? I'm going to uh, deal with this issue in my second argument. Why we think that this is going to necessarily lead to progress? Uh, why we think that they're by uh, not allowing this political party is necessarily going to be like practically good. So moving to the second issue. Now in the status quo, the recognition of this political party as a legitimate political party is necessarily empowering radicalism, unlike Dollar said. Firstly, because this political party allows, no shame, privilege to these, <laughs> to these politicians to make an extremely offensive and intimidating opinion. For example, the leader of the British National Party made an extremely offensive message to the African immigrants living in, uh, in Great Britain. But he was not punished for hate crime law because he had a political immunity against that. The police, th there was a huge political influence towards the police and the police was able, un un unable to prosecute them. That incentivized this politician to make particularly offensive ex ex expression. But secondly, like since we recognize these parties as legitimate, it gives political justification to extremists. It empowers and justifies the act of certain radical, radicalist extremists, such as neo-Nazi. In 2011, a young like, nationalist man in Norway killed 68 innocent people. 
because he was discontent about the Norwegian government's policy, immigration policy. The Nationalist Party in Norway did not did condemn the terrorist act itself, but he, they actually like supported the political ideology be, behind that terrorist act. We believe that as a consequence of that, many neo-Nazis inside Norway use this particular expression, use this particular justification to further justify their like inhumane and ab absolutely unacceptable act. After plan adoption, first of all, it deprives the political immunity from these politicians, meaning it makes it difficult for these people to make extremely offensive and unacceptable remarks. But secondly, like since these organizations actually go underground, it makes the, the claim of these uh, political party much or, or the political group much more unpersuasive. They cannot point to the political sphere. Look, the, we, we are justified in the political sphere. Therefore, therefore, like you should support us. It makes it much more difficult for them to, to persuade like moderate people who are in the middle. We say by allowing this political party, like it allows them to persuade those people in the middle, which is necessarily going to lead to another atrocity. We are very proud of the proposal. Just a bit more, please. 
So we think that after plan, this creates um, great harm, especially in terms of your international relationships. Because if you shut down this discourse internally about different political parties who are different from you, again, internally, as I think you right, we think that this will scare away other countries outside of the EU with conflicting other um, political ideals, say the Arabic world, or you know, you can even call like places like Iraq who are very far right, or Asian countries who also have different political ideas and different cultures about these things. So where did that paper go? But we think that um we think there. Like, um that <laughs> those have different opposing policies, right? They will think if they shut down groups that think differently from the inside, how can they say that they are willing to work with us? If um, they, they, their only way of dealing with opposing ideas are to shut them down, we think this proposal actually sends a message out that the EU is okay with differences, but only if those differences are similar to our different ideas about what's different. Yes? So we know I have so many problems, cultural sensitivities, economic recessions. What is the unique problem we can know only about but by through the discussion with the nationalistic part? Well, if you think about, um, for example, the idea about immigration, right? Or the concerns about, because again, when they brought up a lot about the idea of expelling migrants is harmful and, and things like that, but we think that um, the, if, uh, especially when you think about immigration policies, these, um, the, when you allow migrants to come inside, you have to work about different things, about how, um, uh, we think that a state has every right to prioritize its citizens, to prioritize the citizens' concerns and their wants, and as migrants being non-citizens, then, you know, you, of course you have to acknowledge um, um, or compromise in some way, but we think that the citizens' voice or should be the priority, and these ultra-right, ultra-nationalist groups, they are all for the citizens, right? So we think that they have, hold on please later, that they have an active, therefore, right to express the ideas of how you should protect your citizens because we are your citizens too. I'm sorry later, please. So, okay. So now, the, um, uh, again, back to the idea about the of that harm, right? Because this, we think this will actually um, decrease the willingness to talk, to cooperate, to discuss ideas, and even probably create antipathy within these different um, uh, um, parties, um, international parties. Well, I'm sorry. Under the stage quo, we already have so much conflict between nations of different, of different parties because of these different political ideas, right? You can think about communism, you can think about democracy, democratic countries, Not and we think that, uh, sorry, that this shuts down the conversation and willingness to therefore come together and cooperate because the EU is actively shutting it down itself. Now, into the idea of how um, this will... Okay, you know what? I'll talk about the extremist action first. We think that... Um, so the opening op opposition as well, this idea about they'll go underground, they'll stop public reputation, and we think this is also especially important because um, well, you have to remember that it's not especially fixed. It's not just far right. It's not just far left. There are many different people in between, and that um, so that um, when you think about the neo Nazis, yes, who are outlawed, who are bound, but they are still active and they are still angry on the stage, and they are still causing active harm. We think that maybe if we open them up to public discussion, then you could have had more level-headed, more moderate people swaying for people who are kind of on the border, who are not aware of what is go what kind of discourse is going on inside these neo Nazi policies, to actually be aware of the changing nature of the debate and to therefore decree um, to sway people away from the political ideologies of these neo Nazis. So we empower our extremist groups and result uh, and we create um, because we cut down the avenue of discussion we also allow them the we we force we we, and such as we push them to result to violent action and that in the end this will harm everybody thank you <laughs>
Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and ladies and gentlemen. In 1992, far right parties like Neo Nazi and Republic Party gained a huge influence in political arena in Germany. <coughs> we believe that <coughs> in that particular time, there was a 170 incidents of assault committed against Jewish people. This fact clearly shows that far right parties have the ability to get traction from certain groups of people, especially in times of recession and high un unemployment rate. We believe that it is important for EU states, which recognize universal human rights, to legitimize these political parties as political bodies. But more than that, we believe that it is also important to provide privilege as a political party to facilitate their action. And, <clears throat> and our team is the one which, which gave you the clear mechanism of how we can reduce uh, this political party's ability to get traction from modern, which is extremely important in today's debate. Two issues. Firstly, I'm going to talk about the political discourse in democracy and spread of the EU. And secondly, <coughs> I'm going to talk about how we are going to deal with the far right, uh, far right organizations. So let's talk about the political discourse and the uniqueness of the EU. What we had from the entire, op op entire opposition bench is that we need a discourse and we can know it is wrong uh, <coughs> like through discussion. We have, we have three responses to this. First of all, we believe that, <coughs> first of all, we believe that discourse is meaningless <coughs> when far-right -like, far -like political party does never get moderated through discussion, and the OCAC has already accepted this point. We believe that, no thank you, in democracy, the <coughs> discourse, is a means to, discourse is a means to balance out all people's interests. Yeah. And we, we believe that <coughs> the necessary precondition, no thank you, to participate in democracy, in, no thank you, especially in EU countries, is to respect others and can make a concession to others. When we, when we think about these far-right political parties like neo-Nazi, this is clearly <coughs> not the case. No, thank you. Because they are saying that we should expunge um, Jewish people and Jewish people should be exterminated from the earth. <coughs> the second response to this is that <coughs> the reason why we know uh, this far-right political party's ideology is wrong is not, it's not because we had a discussion on this, but because this ideology is uniquely anti-social. Well, thank you. <coughs> well, what we say is that in society, like respecting others, other people's existence is pretty precondition for people to live together. No, thank you. <coughs> we believe that <coughs> what we told you is that this particular ideology is absolutely wrong, as my partner has already pointed out. And the only thing's response was this: any ideology is exclusive. Well, <coughs> we believe that. This, um, we believe that uh, this far-right ideology is uniquely different from other other kinds of ideology because other kinds of ideology does not say that we should exterminate certain groups of people and certain groups uh, that does not inti intimidate the certain groups, uh, groups of people in the way other ideologies do. Uh, okay. Look, I feel less scared and less intimidated than Mitsushi because I have a fixed scared. How is it a standard criteria for the way a person feels? We believe that the clear distinction between um, <coughs> the clear dis distinction between the far right ideology and other ideology is that those particular far right ideology <coughs> denies the existence of certain people. We believe you are joining the extremely clear right. No, thank you. We believe, that, we believe that it is against the principle of democracy. And it is also against the spirit of. of spread of EU as a society. No, thank you. And what we heard, like, again and again, is that we need a discussion between the far-right parties. No, thank you. Like I said, it's, it is actually meaningless because these far-right parties will never make a concession on this point, and they have never explained like, why conservative party is not enough, and why specifically the far-right party in order to tell that this far-right party is absolutely wrong. No, thank you. Well, what, well, what we told you, uh, what we told you uh, from the entire government bench is the uniqueness of EU as a member state, especially uh, in the democracy. Like opening government has done a good job in framing uh, the uniqueness of EU, but we have told you further about how one like member state EU has already consented to accept that these immigrants, so they have an obligation to set a social structure. No, thank you for the sake of immigrants. But secondly, what we told you 
is that you know EU is already like limiting a right to <coughs> to protect like fundamental human rights, right? No, thank you. If we if we take a like banning of whole post denial or banning of hate speech, uh, that is an excellent example, and we also like ban we also ban. Uh, thank you. The political political. We believe that it's especially. Uh, in this in this context, EU should not uh, provide a privilege for this uh, for this uh, extreme uh, far right ideology <coughs> to voice out, no, thank you, to voice out uh, their view in political arena. This naturally leads me to the second issue, which is about how we are going to deal with the far right organizations. No, thank you. What we have from the entire opposition bench is that. Well, somehow, after taking this proposal, this extreme organization will be radicalized. Open opposition said these parties will go underground. But thank you, closing opposition's ex extension said that well, these people will become radicalized because they have no choice but to resort to violent action after taking this proposal. What we say is that this organization is already radicalized, yeah. even in the status quo. Well, look at Norway, the nationalist, a young guy. Which are against the immigration policy of Norway are actually a huge six is of huge like sixty like people uh, in the avenue of terrorism. Even that radicalization is still uh, taking place, even when this course is allowed uh, in the status quo. So what we say is that the clear difference between after the Guinness proposal and the status quo is that after the Guinness proposal, as my partner has given you a clear mechanism, we can re we can remove the ability of the far right political party to attract get traction from moderate people. For two reasons, firstly, there, there will no longer be political immunity in the area of speech in public space, but secondly, the, we, we reduce the ability to persuade moderate people because we are going to delegitimize these political parties. For all these reasons, we are very proud to propose. Ladies and gentlemen of the House, in what is my last speech as a student debater, I couldn't be prouder to stand here and defend debate, because that is what this proposal is about, is the right for society to talk and debate about things. And under this, if we take government proposal, that will stop. Even if these extremists will not change their mind, they still have the right to explain their voice. I cannot understand government's proposal because it's an entire contradiction. They say it's bad to stop denying, to deny the existence of people, and so they want to adopt a proposal that denies a group of people in society. They say they want to protect human rights. They want to protect human rights by revoking the human rights of a group of people within society. I wish this contradiction had been explained earlier, but it hasn't been throughout the entirety of government bench. Their case is a complete flaw. But how am I going to break down this round for you today? I'm going to look at three issues. Is this policy good for the EU internally? Is this policy good for the EU externally, which is something Casey brought you no engagement from closing whatsoever? And finally, what is actually going to happen in the AP? Because I think of all of government's case, that is the most ridiculous of what is going to happen in the AP. They think these parties are just going to disappear and become quiet and normal members of society. No. Offense has told you it's going to get much, much worse. Every harm they don't like now will be intensified immensely. And for that reason alone, we should win this debate. Okay, um, I'll take you before I start. Okay, so what kind of productive discussion would be made with these ultra far right political party? Why is like conservative party not enough to foster discussion? Mm -hmm. If they are allowed to explain their voice, do you think that that does not calm some of them down? Yes, we had one crazy guy in Norway, but if we take this proposal, we're going to have 20 crazy guys in Norway, and they're going to combine. <laughs>
EU policy, this is correct, this is what the EU should do, EU consented to all of these things. First of all, EU, there's still debate going on within countries, they're still fighting within countries about EU policy, so I don't think every single person agrees with every single thing the EU does. But, as Casey told you, this is the way we are going to actually reform and refine EU policy. And so we're going to make things better by hearing what's going on in states. And even if the EU is so great, as Casey told you, not everyone is for this globalization, right? There are a lot of people who still believe in the nation state, who still respect the nation state, and who still want to see it prioritized. If we take their proposal, those people are getting shut out, and we don't think that's right. Because as Casey also told you, they want to talk about human rights for migrants. First of all, they don't understand the difference between a right, I'm not using the mic, the right and a privilege. I am a migrant to Japan. I am not here because I have a human right to be a migrant in Japan. I am here because the government of Japan granted me the privilege to come here. If any state in the EU wants to listen to its citizens, which they should in a democracy, because that's the fundamental value of the EU, democracy, and its citizens want to kick out those migrants who are there by privilege of the government they instated, they absolutely have the right to do that. It's not a human rights violation. It's what the government is allowed to do because it should respect the will of its citizens. No, sit down. And we think that would actually be better because why are these parties radical and violent? Because the government is not listening to them. It's not listening to what the people want. And so maybe if it actually listened to these sides every now and then and expel the immigrants like they wanted, then things would get better, but they don't. And so then if you shut down the discourse entirely, like I said before, it's going to make them even angrier. And so internally for the EU, this is not going to be good. You're going to have more people, which is going to result, or you're going to have less discourse, which is going to result in these people going underground, which is going to result naturally in violence and terrorism. Yes, we see it under the status quo, but it will get that much worse in the after plan. Okay, talk again. So the terrorism can be minimized by police enforcement. Don't you think it's more harmful to have far right party with the le legitimacy and legal enforcement? To okay, press thank the you. You actually reminded me of scale. something I was going to forget. So they wanted to say, <laughs> the, state, the only actual problem they gave under the status quo is immunity for politicians. Here's a thought: get rid of the immunity. Problem solved. Then you can prosecute the politicians. That legitimacy doesn't really stand anymore. But they still have the right to be a political party, which again means they have the right to express their voice, which again means, again, the majority of them aren't going to feel repressed in terms of violence necessarily. Again, it's a comparison. When are we going to see more violence? In the status quo or the after plan? I think op bench has proved clearly it's going to be in the after plan. No. So thought, secondly, what is good for the EU externally? And this was something uniquely brought to you from closing opposition, right? So Casey said they want to talk about the policy and value of the EU. The EU wants to promote unity and say we're willing to compromise. But in this proposal, the EU is cutting out unity and showing, no, we won't compromise. If you don't agree with what we think our value is, we're just going to make you shut up and go stay in your home. And so how can the EU actually go abroad and try to make relations with other countries? No, sit down. How can the EU make relations with other countries with this idea when they can clearly see it's a hypocrisy? Who is going to believe the EU is going to come and work and compromise with me if the EU can't even do it internally with its own people? Because what is going on here is the EU is people punishing people whose values are different than theirs. So how can you compromise with countries whose values are different than theirs? That's the message that will be sent that will be danger to the EU politically. And so finally, I've already talked about this, but what is going to happen in the after plan? From government, the only thing we've really heard is that these parties are going to calm down and things are going to get better. We can punish them. Under the status quo, if they go too far, we can punish them already. So that's not going to change. We gave you the reasonable analysis, especially Casey and I pointed this in the beginning. They're going to get violent. We do not need more violence. We do not need more radicalism. If their entire analysis is right, and these people are so already so angry and hate-filled, that's the only correct thing I think the government bench has said. If they're that angry, what do you think they're going to do when you silence them? They're going to get angry. They're going to get violent. If you compare the after plan harm alone, this is clearly an op bench win because this is only going to promote farther harm. Thank you. Thank you for all the time.